Hello everyone and welcome to today's video. So as you can see we have a draft booster box of Dungeons and Dragons Adventures in the Forgotten Realms open today. And uh, Valky kind of looks like Cyclops a little bit with this uh, blocking his face. But before we get to that though, I have a couple of promo packs we're going to open from Keldheim. I was given these uh, by my local game store, the CG Realm. And so we're going to open these up on camera and see how we do. So they have a great selection of singles and I'm going to link their website below so you can check them out. I'm actually going to take the uh, arena code off. All right, so let's see how we did. So we get a Temple of Deceit. Now I like the way that they do these because, uh, you know, the Planeswalker symbol's there, but you can kind of ignore it. It's not quite as obnoxious I find as like the pre-release promos. And I like that, you know, it's there. It doesn't really bother me too much. So that's a pretty sweet one to get. And we get Usher of the Fallen. So I think this is a pretty decent card if you're playing some kind of white wingy strategy in standard. So nice one to get from of, And we get the Raven's Warning. So this is one of these sagas. Unfortunately, I don't think this one's really taken off though. I have seen some people try to play it, but uh, still cool though, especially to get that little Planeswalker symbol down there. So that was pack one and pack two. All right, so we get another temple. So this time we get a Temple of Malice. So the Malice at the Palace. So pretty sick to get temples. And we get Frostbite as our promo in this case. I never really looked at the art too carefully, but that is terrifying. That poor guy's gonna get his arm like chewed off by that uh, frost creature. So if you look at the flavor text, don't wander far, it's a bit nippy out there. So there you go. But this is a pretty sick card though. I know like a lot of decks were playing this um, just like with Snowlands, just to be able to get this effect. So it's a pretty strong card, pretty awesome to get. And we hit a Toski Bearer of Secrets. So this is a card that's seeing play a lot, um, even just uh, casually as well as some constructive play. Uh, yeah, pretty sick card to get and uh, definitely happy to add that to my collection. So that's the older stuff. Let's get that out of the way. And let's move into today's stuff. So again, our forget uh, uh, Ventures in the Forgotten Realm box. So, um, just to uh, let you know though, I'm not, I don't have a strong background in Dungeons and Dragons. So, um, you know, a lot of this set is, I'm looking at it from a magic point of view in terms of the cards. Um, you know, admittedly, the set isn't one that was made for me. Um, I appreciate though that it exists and I'm happy to uh, crack it open and see what kind of goodies we get. Um, but unfortunately, you know, a lot of the names and characters and things like that are gonna resonate with me. And again, I'm perfectly okay with that, but, uh, you know, something that might be exciting to somebody watching this may not necessarily be exciting to me because again, I don't know the relevance of the character, right? But I'm here for some of these sick new cards. So let's put the box over there. And I've just, uh, you know, I'm doing a lot of um, drop boxes now because you know what, I just find the set boosters, I just don't pull as well, which is kind of contrary to what everyone's saying. And plus like the foils, I don't really care too much about the foils. So it's, uh, you know, I just find the draft boxes, I get more on commons and commons that I need you know, to kind of complete play sets. And, you know, because that's one thing I like having to do is not having to run out and try to find, uh, especially locally, it's always tough, to, you know, to find the chase on commons. You know, people want them, people get them. So, again, it's always kind of a pain to go get them. So if I can get a couple, little, you know, in a box, make it easier for myself. I know the innkeeper is one that people have talked about. And uh, kind of a cool effect, right? Makes it a treasure and then you get uh, that uh, ability to gain life. Now this one's not quite a Soul Warden and because it's only under your control, but still pretty sweet. And I can speak really good in the, in the right matchup. And then we get Eye of Vecna. So I know there's a couple other Vecna cards. So this is the Eye. Um, yeah, it definitely seems like a commander type card, right? Because you, anything that lets you uh, accrue value like that is pretty sick. And we get our land. And ooh, the spider token, that's really cool. Unfortunately though, like a lot of the spiders aren't two one reaches with Menace, so, you know, I, I would appreciate using those for like other decks and constructed cards that use uh, tokens. You know, I don't know how much use I'm gonna get out of two ones. Those are, seems like a very specific card. So we get, uh... but one of the big mythics I'm looking for is like a Deming Lich. That's a card I, I'm definitely excited. Mimic, that's, I love the art on it. I love the effect. Like that to me is like an example of a great top-down design card. Just a lot of positive, positive things going on with it. And then of course you have your dice rolling and, you know, I don't really mind too much the dice rolling. I always, I, you know, I like playing the last unhinged set. 
unglued, whatever it was called, and uh, with the dice rolling, I thought that was kind of exciting. Um, I don't necessarily want like a high profile tournament or anything decided by it, but you know, I don't mind a little bit. Especially with this stuff, it doesn't seem to make a, too big a difference, you know. Saying that's not relevant, but just that, you know, there are some cards where it's like a minimal. You scry two versus scry one kind of thing. And we get our Caves of the Frost Dragon. So this one actually is pretty sick, though, the value you get from that. Um, the This is a little confusing, you know. It's kind of like the uh, Fast Lands, but it's like the opposite of those. So um, it's kind of weird how it's worded. But, uh, you know, getting a 3-4 flyer is pretty sick. Reminds me of another uh, land. And then we get a... Ooh token for the uh, green white legendary. Um, you know, it reminds me of another, uh, was a 4-4 flyer. Celestial Colonnade was uh, was pretty darn good. I'm not saying this is good as Colonnade, but you know, don't uh, don't doubt it. Now, I heard this has been like a pain for, for uh, content, not content, but like stores and stuff, just having the plus two as part of the, uh, the name. I don't know if that's, you know, how big a deal it is, but just kind of funny when you see your stuff like that. Okay, and let's see, check for traps, it's a pretty sick, pretty car cool card. Zorn, so if you would create one or more treasure tokens, instead create those tokens plus one additional treasure. Seems quite good in any kind of deck that's focusing on treasures. And I even like the Modern Horizons 2 stuff, has a lot of good stuff that cares about treasures, so. Okay, and then we have a foil inspiring bard. So it's got that kind of flavor text. And uh, yeah, I don't mind this for this set. I don't, wouldn't want to see it all the time, but it is, um, you know, it's a cool flavor thing. Um, ooh, and a fairy dragon is our token. So yeah, I don't mind having like that flavor text kind of be on the card, you know, as long again as it's not permanent um, or just like all the, you know, if they make future D&D &D sets, that kind of thing. Uh, the one thing I don't understand is like lack of party as a mechanic, because that seems like a, cl a clear plant. Ooh, and this is the Evolving Wilds and the uh, old D&D &D, uh, cover style. So interesting. And there is like a bit of a, I don't know if you can kind of catch it, but especially at the bottom, you can see that kind of like, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's like just like it comes off. Okay. Some kind of stuff on there. So that's a cool one to see. Weird to finally see it in person. And then we get another special frame. And we get Meteor Swarm as our rare. So... Eight damage as divided as you choose among X target creatures and or planeswalkers. So you can do eight damage to something for three mana, or you can start dividing it up. So that's a cool design. I like that. And we get a foil cleric class. So, you know, it's tough to get excited about foils just because, um, put that in our rare file. The fact that, you know, they're so readily available, you know, compared to for collector boosters that you know, I don't know many that, you know, besides being chase rares, etc., that have like any kind of value. Like it used to be that you could say, okay, this, you know, one of the more playable on commons has some value, but it's now like minimal. Whereas before, if you, you know, got a decent one, you could really hit a home run in that regard. But it seems like it's quite difficult now to do that, which is a little bit unfortunate, but just the way, uh, way things go. So here's a Celestial Unicorn. It definitely has a D&D &D vibe. And the Purple Worm. Yeah, that art I'm not as, uh, not as excited about. Um, Blue Dragon. And we get Sphere of Annihilation. So this is one of those really wordy ones. So you pay X uh, to get X Void Counters on at the beginning of your upkeep. Exile, Sphere of Annihilation, all creatures and Planeswalkers with mana value less than or equal to the number of Void Counters on and all creatures and Planeswalker cards and Graveyard's mana value equal to or less than the number of Void Counters on it. Okay, so I guess we have everything in play and on here. So it's like a delayed... Um, Kind of like a pernicious Z kind of in that effect, which is really delayed. So typically those cards, um, there's a dungeon with a, I'm guessing that's a card. It, yeah, it's a token it makes. That's cool. Um, typically those kind of cards though aren't the greatest because again, you're letting your opponent uh, have time to kind of set up. They see it coming. Now you might still get them or you might get them to, you know, not play anything for a turn. You know, sometimes it does work out in your favor, but generally speaking, you don't really want your opponent to have time, um, you know, to know what you're kind of doing. You're going to want to just spring it on them. So there's another rule book uh, card. Wizard class. Very nice. Burning hand. Another cleric class. And werewolf pack leader. 
So this one is uh, has pack tactics. Uh, when it attacks, if you attack with creatures with total power six or greater, greater this combat, draw a card. I just seem like a mechanic that should have been around before. Um, I love the stats on this though. Double green for three three, and then. Um, it's base power and toughness becomes 5-3 trample and it's inhuman. So like this card to me is like awesome. I don't know if there's a deck for it, but it doesn't seem like there's a lot of, you know, much work you need other than having a heavy concentration of green to make that card, um, you know, really stand out. I love the, uh, I love the stats on it. And then like having two abilities with upside, including one that says draw card, sign me up. Okay, Tiger Tribe, I like the name. Dungeon Map, that's a cool name. It's a shame it couldn't be like Expedition Map and go get a land. Druid Class, nice to see. And we get a um, alternate um, art of Gelatinous Cube. So this one, when it comes in play Exile, target non-ooze creature and opponent controls until this leads the battlefield. And then it dissolves uh, X black and then it essentially puts the card exiled into its owner's graveyard. So essentially what this does is this um, is like a fiend hunter that can temporarily steal the creature until your opponent, if your opponent kills this, they get it back. And then you can pay mana to permanently get rid of it. So if you think of it like you're, um, you know, temporarily stealing it and then killing it with the dissolve ability. So really, this one really depends on how you kind of look at it. You know, you could look at it and say, well, you have to pay Four mana to get the body and then pay more mana to make sure you permanently get rid of it. Whereas a lot of those effects, you don't get the option, right? You can you basically just temporarily get rid of it until your opponent decides to uh, kill it or gets a kill spell or whatever. So it is nice that you have the option, especially if you have mana laying around and there's no like, um, you know, do this only on a sorcery or anything like that. So uh, that's pretty sick. Speaking of pretty sick, we have Owl Bear here. So just a cool card. And then a certain little rec uh, reclusive painter. Oh, some troll. Oh, I thought that was gonna be the rare. <laughs> Just because it looks like it should be a rare. But no, rogue classes are rare. So I opened in one of these in my pre-release kits. So I don't have much to say about this one. It does a lot of stuff. Uh, I like that the abilities all work together. It allows you to uh, essentially get cards off the top of the deck. And then once you fully level up the rogue class, you get to start casting them. And we get a jaw goblin javelin here. Very nice. I'm sure if you go back to my first video where they had these alternate kind of art frame cards, I was very excited. I think it was like a Coria. I was like, oh man, look at this one. Cause it was like the comic book style. And then, you know, again, like anything, once you've done it like five or six times, it starts to lose its appeal a little bit. Though I still think these ones are really cool, but you know, the idea that it's gonna be on like highly playable cards is kind of a been debunked. Um, this guy's pretty cool though. Makes a lot of goblins. As you give your goblins uh, plus one plus zero in haste. And we get our first mythic, Flame Skull. So I think this is an interesting card in that, um, you know, it, it's just a 3-1 flyer, can't block, you know, maybe a little overcosted for that ability. Or if you want, you know, if it is, it's like a common or something, or maybe an uncommon. It's certainly not a rare mythic. Uh, but then you get the rejuvenation. So when it dies, you can exile it. And if you do exile the top card of your library until the end of your next, next turn, you're going to play one of those cards. So not only does it let you keep bringing it back, but you also potentially get a better card if you want. So I think that is a, uh, a pretty sweet card. It's a shame that you can't, it doesn't trigger anywhere else from, uh, from dying though. So you do actually have to cast it. So uh, in that regard, it's not quite as exciting, you know, and maybe the prospect of casting a 3-1 every turn isn't going to be there. Here we go, there's another unicorn. Wild shape. Now I did see this one in a uh, modern uh, infect deck. So I had to read again to see what it is. And I, I'm still not quite sure uh, what about this card is would be good enough for infect. Uh, maybe you can let me know in the comments if what I'm missing with this card. But you know, I, I get the flexibility with the, the hex proof, but like even like blossoming defense is plus two plus two, right? Like and hex proof, it does both. Because effectively if you know you have a one one whatever, um, infect creature, you know, you can make it a three, three trampler seems like, you know, it's the biggest one you can make. So essentially that's plus two, plus two and trample, or you make it a one, three with hex proof. Don't see you making too many, you know, one, five spiders with reach. So, you know, I don't really see the upside to this card versus the other card. So again, I must be missing, uh, something, uh, that makes people want to play this. Oops. And then we get adult gold dragon. That's such a weird name, adult gold dragon. 
Um, yeah, just kind of like run-of-the-mill stats. Feels almost like an intro deck kind of card. Um, and we get Devoted Paladin. And we get Mordekainen. That's maybe my best my best uh, pronunciation of that. Yeah, the Adult Gold Dragon is certainly uh, interesting. You'd think the stats would be a little bit better, right? But like, it certainly feels like it could just be like a... I mean, it feels like a common or an uncommon gold card, to be honest. Like, I could see definitely see an uncommon, I guess, version of that card. It seems odd to be rare. Um, yeah, I don't really get it. Oh, here's another Evolving Wilds. Very nice. Be cool to get a place out of those. We also have our Blink Dog. And we get Skeletal Swarming. So this thing this is like the quote unquote tribal um, skeleton card. So each skeleton you control is trample, tax each common to enable, and gets plus uh, X plus zero, where X is the number of other skeletons you control. And we are end step, create X tapped uh, one one black skeleton creature tokens. Um, no, sorry, create a one, not X. Um, if a creature die this turn, create two tokens instead. Okay, so it gives you kind of like a, Kind of like the way they were doing zombies back in Industry, where it's just like an endless supply of skeletons. And then, you know, they keep getting bigger and bigger. You know, it's probably too expensive to be good enough for constructed, but, you know, for anyone that wants building casual decks or if you're building a skeleton EDH deck or something, seems like that would be a very fun card to build around, kind of. Okay. Oh, it's slipping all over the place. Well, I will say these cards are like, the, the card stock feels good on these. Green Dragon. And we get Forsworn Paladin. So this is a 1-1 Menace. Uh, you can pay life and tap uh, and pay 2 mana to create a treasure token. And then pay 3, target creature gets plus 2 plus 0 until in turn of mana from a treasure with spent to activate its ability, the creature also gains death touch. So, yeah, it's got a lot of abilities, uh, but it's just none of them are really that exciting. You know, the 1-1 Menace on its own is, you know, not gonna, not gonna excite anyone. The ability to make a treasure is would be pretty expensive and also requires life. Right. Yeah, you can do it on turn two, I guess. So it acts like, I guess, like a ramp creature. And then the last ability. Um, yeah, it just feels more like a draft card. Again, another card that I don't know if it necessarily had to be rare. Um, could see it being something else. Oh, that's a cute one, though. Pixie Guide. I like it. Critical hit. Great name. And we hit the Book of Vile Darkness. So a second mythic. So triple black at the beginning of your end step. If you lost two more life this turn, create a 2 black zombie creature token and exile it in an artifact and control name Eye of Vecna uh, and Hand of Vecna. Create a Vecna legendary 8-8 black zombie god creature token with indestructible. It gains all triggered abilities of the exiled cards. Wow, that's a lot to uh, say. Um, yeah, it definitely feels like a great, uh, like, flavorful card. Right? Like a whole... Whole step going on there. Clearly not going to be playing this in any kind of tournament setting, but I think it's a great fun card though. Like that would be awesome to build the deck around commander or like casual or whatever. And like and then you get to go off, and that seems like you just uh, you win. You know, if you don't actually win the game, right? That should be that should just be the thing, right? You win. Bag of holdings. So this is a uh, cool looking one. Moon blessed cleric. Flump. So this is also in my uh, pre-release kit. Yeah, I don't know. I don't like giving my opponents cards. Even if I get them too. No, I don't really like it. Maybe if you're playing a control deck. Yeah. It definitely incentivizes them to not attack. But uh, whether they do or don't, I don't know. Certainly a card that might be... may not help you. So Baleful Beholder. I mean, look at the art on that. How, how awesome is that, though? Just works so well, that card. Hulking Bugbear. Such a weird name. But it is a goblin. 3 3 haste. Nice stats. And then another. And we get Hail of Storm Giant. So again, this is part of the creature land cycle. So this is a little more expensive, though. Six mana, so I'm definitely not cheap. Uh, becomes a 7 7 giant creature with Ward 3. It's all land. So don't know if it's quite as good for like control decks. Just because the. I mean, it's effectively costing you 7 mana to attack. And. I mean, you kind of want to pay as little as possible. I think the flyer is probably better suited. You know, if looking at comparing the two, I think the flyer, the white one that we had earlier, is I think the better one. 
Oh, another pixie. Power word kill. Okay, so this one I have heard of. So this destroys target non-angel, demon, devil, dragon. So pretty good though, instant. Kills most things. Um, though when it does come up, it's gonna be kind of annoying, right? It's gonna be like in those situations where exactly what it's meant to be, right? But I could just be like, oh, really? And we get the green creature in the cycle. So this becomes, um, so it's X green. So it becomes an XX green hydro creature. Uh, still land X can't be zero. So I guess you can't pay one green to uh, kill it. So that seems quite good though. Like being able to scale it up, right? And like late game, if you need chump block, right? Just two mana to animate this to make it a one, one chump block. And then late game, you have like tons of mana lying around. Just swing all out. Like a deck, like uh, the mono green deck um, in Pioneer uh, generates a ton of mana. Like that's a card that I could see playing like one of these. Cause that would be uh, quite, uh, quite good. I really like the treasure. Like being able to scale up like that when you just have like a ton of mana and nothing to do with it. Uh, the only downside to that is, you know, that I think the restriction on the um, coming to play on tap is, a little, you know, a little tricky sometimes to pull off. Um, you probably want it to come play un, into play on tap more often, but you know, what are you gonna do? So we get Temple of the Dragon Queen. So I must say these do look a lot better in person than they did online. Not sure about that card though. It's kind of like a really restrictive way to generate mana. Like name it and then you can only do certain things with it. All right, so we get teleportation circle. So beginning of your end step, exile up to one target artifact or creature control and return to the battlefield under its owner's control. Now, that's pretty good. I can definitely see that being popular in uh, Commander with like all the blink decks and things like that, right? Where you just wanna reuse those uh, enter the battlefield effects or, you know, put more charge counters on your artifact. Secret door foil. And uh, oh, we get another, we get Ellie Wick Tumblestrum, another emblem. Um, just be able to like, reuse all those effects, right? Like a mole drifter or something seems pretty awesome. I like, I like those kind of effects. It's getting a nice free blink. And you don't have to pay an extra mana into it, like you just pay the one time fee and then you just kind of reap the benefits afterwards. So there's a regular Evolving Wilds. And we get Dire Wolf Prowler. So, like, like, what is that, like Droll or maybe even something else. <laughs> Body parts, blood of some kind. True Polymorph, so this card, I don't understand why this card, again, this is another card that was in my pre-release kit. I don't understand why it's so expensive. I know it permanently does it, but six mana. Like Mirror Weave from all the way back in um, Shadowmoor, like major whole team of creature until end of turn. But like with that, you could just be like, okay, I'm gonna make uh, everyone this, um, this Lord, make everyone gigantic. It's like, yeah, that's only four mana. And again, it only lasts on the turn, but if you're gonna kill your opponent, it doesn't matter. Or this thing, you gotta like pay six mana to get one thing to change. Though it is an instant and it's, uh, well, here's some skeletons, clattering skeletons. So this is the one, uh, I didn't realize it was, uh, that had that alternate art. It's cool. Dragon Disciple. Skull Port Merchant. Yeah, he looks shady. Dwarf citizen, I like it. And we get Grazalax Ithid Scholar. That is really creepy art. Man, that is like sucking like the brains out of their head. So it's a three, two for three. Uh, when a creature controller becomes blocked, may return to its owner's hand. And when one or more creatures you control deal common damage to a player, draw a card. So pretty cool. Um, you know, it'd be awesome in some sort of like mono blue deck, though typically they play a pretty low curve in those mono blue aggressive decks, so maybe, but I do like the abilities. I just don't know how strong they actually are. Like, I guess if you have a lot of like cheap come into play effects or enter the battlefield effects, ETBs, um, you know, being able to return the creatures to your hand would be pretty beneficiary, um, you know, or you get to deal damage to them. So that's nice. I think like new players would love that, right? Because then, if, uh, if they didn't see a block or something happens, then you could return it to your hand. Ooh, the Demigorgon Clutches. That's a cool name for a card. Trickster's Talisman. Magic Missile. And we get Zalto Fire Giant Duke. So it's a five mana, seven, three Trampler. Whenever it is dealt damage, venture into the dungeon. So these, this is one of those uh, parasitic cards. I'm actually surprised we haven't seen more of those. Ooh, the Dog Illusion. It's cute. Um, I'm surprised we haven't seen more of those kind of cards where, where they're uh, fully relying on the dungeon, right? 
And given, you know, this nature of the set, you know, we expect to be a certain amount of parasitic uh, mechanics, but I mean, venturing in the dungeon clearly is a, you know, a poster child for parasitic mechanics. You're never going to, you know, nothing else in the game is going to re refer dungeons or venturing. So if it ain't in here, you're probably not going to get it anytime soon. Lightfoot Rogue. Monk of the Open Hand. So I think this is the one that works with the Planeswalker, I believe, if I recall. There it is, the Demi-Lich. All right, the box has been made. So the reason why I want this card is to, uh, you know, try it out in um, uh, Phoenix in uh, Modern, because it uh, works pretty well. And the cool thing about this one, too, is it not only, like, works in the graveyard, but the cost reduction means that you can actually just cast her in your hand. Like, it's not like Phoenix where you have to, like, discard it in order to you know, really take advantage of it. This card, you can easily just play it out of your hand, get the 4-3, or, you know, if you had to discard a card, discard it and then get it back later. Like, I think that card's a home run. Just an awesome, awesome card. I'm very happy to have one. And that's why sometimes, you know, when you're looking at uh, purchasing singles before you open up your product, you don't always, <laughs> you don't do so. As bad as your luck might be, you, uh, you wait on that. So we get another clanging, clattering skeletons. Celestial unicorn. So it's weird to see like the non, um, like alternate frame ones, right? After you've seen so many of them. So almost gonna recognize them. Oh, Lotham troll, that is a, yeah, that is definitely his Lotham. Oh, this is the, uh, this is the coin flip guy, right? Roll, oh, sorry, roll one or more dice. Okay, so this is a different one. Uh, this guy's concerned with dice. So, um, gains flying and minutes on turn. If, any other results was 10 or higher draw card. Seems pretty good. And we get the Planeswalker that we got earlier. Oh, the, sorry, the yeah, Planeswalker. And then, oh, I see the illusion, okay. So uh, we did get the um, the emblem. We got this one earlier, that's what I was gonna say. Um, Morden Kanan. Uh, so it's a six mana, five uh, starting loyalty Planeswalker, plus two, draw two cards and put a card in your hand on the bottom of your library, so interesting. Doesn't go back on top. So it actually might be better, you know, a lot of instances, especially in standard where you don't have a lot of ways to shuffle your deck, you know, for that kind of brainstorm effect. Um, you know, not getting stuck drawing a card again, it seems pretty strong. And minus two creative dog, blue dog illusion creature token with this creature's power and toughness is equal to twice the number of cards in your hand. I like it. So it usually should be pretty big, especially if you're using the plus two. And then exchange your hand and library, then shuffle, you get an emblem with you have no maximum hand size. So you know, I haven't really heard anyone talk about the Planeswalkers in this set, so again, I'm not a, I'm not an expert, certainly on Planeswalkers. Um, you know, not so much recently where most Planeswalkers have been pretty uh, low power level, but there was a time when, like, everyone was over-evaluating every Planeswalker because they assumed, like, everyone was going to be broken. So we've gone from that to, like, kind of the opposite where everyone just thinks every Planeswalker is unplayable now. So it's tough to get a handle on, um, you know, more often than not, they're not great anymore. You know, especially at six mana is a really tough hill to uh, overcome. Um, but, you know, maybe. I, I certainly, I mean, none of the abilities seem terrible. I just don't know, um, you know, at six mana, if that's something decks are going to want, I guess. And there's been a lot of good Planeswalkers, especially like in blue and controlling colors that just never get there because I think there's no deck around it that wants to tab out for six mana. You know, if it's like white or something where you can play like a more mid-range deck, then I think... You might be able to uh, take advantage of that, but otherwise, it's, sometimes it's really tough. And we get now we get the hand of Vecna. So three mana at the beginning of your combat on your turn, a quick creature gets quick creature, or a creature you control named Vecna gets plus X plus X in all in turn where X is the number of cards in your hand. Equip, pay one life for each card in your hand. Oh, okay. And then it also has equip too. Okay, so you can either you have like no cards or like one card you can just. Equip it for free or a low amount of life. I mean, that's pretty good though, because you can essentially, you know, pay three mana and just put it on a creature right away, right? Especially if you're early in the game. Maybe you have like a flyer or some sort of evasive creature. You know, paying four or five life might be worth it just to get this going. You know, especially if your opponent's tapped out and you know you can get that damage and you're effectively, you know, hitting both players to that life. So, um, you know, it's not as bad as it seems where you're just going to be paying life. Now, if you do it later and they kill it in response or something, yeah, that looks really bad. But, uh, you know, if you can get away with it early, then it's probably worth it. So here's Sorcerer class. So, uh, enters the battlefield, draw two cards, then discard two. Okay, so, oh, all right. Uh, certainly not worth the card. Um, it gets to level two. It's creatures you control add 
Who are red? Spend this only mana only cast instants or sorceries. Or gain a class level. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Because normally it would just be instant or sorceries. Uh, and then whenever you cast an instant or sorcery, that spell deals damage to the opponent equal to the number of instant and sorcery you've cast this turn. Yeah, I kind of would hope it would be a little bit more exciting than that, but I don't know. What can you do? All right, so here we go. We got Hobgoblin Bandit Lord. So three mana, other goblins you control get plus one, plus one, and one tap uh, deals damage equal to the number of goblins at the battlefield under your control this turn to any target. That seems sick, especially like in a deck that can uh, take advantage of that. You know, I'm thinking more about like a commander-ish deck where you have like a bunch of tokens into the battlefield. Like, I mean, getting to deal like three or four damage something for one mana while also providing you know the lord effect seems quite strong i mean and you know i'm sure there's some broken things you can do that puts a lot more than that but it seems like a home run for any kind of uh commander deck like that i don't know if it has it might still have you know it might could also have applications in constructed as well um i'm certainly no expert on goblins so i wouldn't uh, be the first best person to ask so now we have delina wild mage so this one is interesting um Probably not good enough for Constructed. It's a four mana, three, two. And whenever it attacks, you can roll, and then essentially you get to make uh, a copy of a creature that's uh, that's attacking, except it's not legendary, which is a pretty big upside. Um, and it only lasts till end of turn. And then if you, keep, if you roll 15 to 20, you get to keep doing it again. So you get to make more copies of stuff. And then we hit a Foil Mind Flayer. That's really cool to see in the uh, alternate frame of the foil. Um, yeah, it looks... It's, Looks crazy. So this is a five mana three three, and when it enters the battlefield, gain control of target creature for as long as you control Mind Flayer. I don't know much about Mind Flayers, but it seems like that's uh, certainly um, that box. That's certainly probably um, on flare, flare, <laughs> on flavor. That. All right, let's make some space. Put these over here. I will say like the. It's hard to kind of see in this, but like the, the foiling really pops when you look at it and it hits the light that way. Um, that does look pretty nice. Which you wouldn't think, because there's not much foiling, but just the background, but it does really pop. All right, and we hit Loyal Warhound. So this is a, a throwback to an older uh, card, um, Knight, of the, Knight of the White Orchid, which is also a throwback to another card. Um, that uh, allows you to grant lands at your deck. So essentially it's all based on like land, the land tax where if your opponent controls more land than you, you go, go to get a land. Now this one is, um, the original one was double white for 2-2 first striker, uh, but this one's a 3-1 vigilance. So not quite, I think it's as strong. Um, I mean though like a 3-1 for two mana isn't nothing to sneeze at. Um, the nice thing is too, is that, uh, um, you know, you can play this, get the land, then play a land after it. And that's kind of like the real, sort of hidden um, feature of this card, right? It lets you go get more lands. Um, get, get a land even if you have one to play kind of thing, right? So you're controlling it. Now this one is ta uh, forcing you to get a basic planes. So there's no uh, no shock lands around that you can go get. So it is, they did have corrected that a little bit. Not that there, I don't know if there's any, I guess you can get the triomes right now um, if they didn't have that clause, which would be pretty good. Um, it, is, it is splashable too, so. But unfortunately, it is just a basic plane, so no, no uh, super crazy value. So here's our Underdark Basilisk, and oh, there's a Baleful Beholder. If you want to see the non-alternate uh, art, Black Dragon, and here we get Varus Silvery Moon Ranger. So again, this is another one of those cards that cares about um, venturing in the dungeons. So it has Reach Ward at the three mana, uh, three three. And when you cast a creature or planeswalker spell, venture in the dungeon, this spell triggers only once each turn. And then when you complete a dungeon, you get a 2 2 wolf. So on stats or anything, it looks great. Um, you know, the only issue with the card, right, is that, you know, it requires you to play, you know, a dungeon deck. So, you know, I think that kind of limits the sort of obviously the decks you want to put it in. Um, though I will say in that one, you know, it obviously does a lot on its own, so you don't necessarily need to be playing a ton of cards at Venture in the Dungeon. But I still think you want to be playing some, right? Like, that's the whole point of Venturing in the Dungeons is to, to get through as fast as possible, reap all the benefits, so. That seems quite good, right? And if you ignore the uh, Dungeon Clause at the bottom at 2-1. You know, we've had stuff like that in the past that's been playable. And here we go, Orcus, Prince of Underdeath, Undeath, sorry. 
So I remember um, watching and listening to one of the podcasts. Uh, they were talking about this, um, the Arena Deck List. Like this, they have this uh, the number one card in the set. We're constructed. Don't know if I necessarily agree with it, but um, certainly it's a powerful card, right? On its on its base stats, even if you pay uh, don't pay X, it's a uh, four mana for four five three flying triple, and then whatever you pay X, uh, each other creature gets negative X negative X until in turn you lose X life, and return X target uh, creature cards total mana value X or less. Um, from the graveyard to the battlefield to gain haste until end turn. So while both abilities seem pretty sick, you know, you're not going to be paying too much mana into it. So I like, think about like one or two mana in most games, right? So I think, uh, you know, both effects are actually could be quite, quite good. Um, I don't know if it's maybe just like the color combination that's scaring me off the card a little bit. Or the fact that it's only a 5-3, which is, you know, is impressive when you look at it, but then, you know... 5-3. So I guess it's maybe maybe it's a card that's really you know better for certain matchups, I could see. You know, obviously anything kind of creature matchup. You know, if White Weenie becomes a deck, then that's certainly a card I could see being big um, as a counter to it. And we get Frog Hemoth. I like the name. It's a uh, frog horror, five mana four four, trample haste. Seems pretty good at the start. Uh, and then when it deals common damage your player exile uh, that many cards from their graveyard, put a plus one counter on. Frog Hemoth for each creature card exile this way. You gain one life for each non-creature card exile this way. Okay, so basically when it attacks, you get to exile um, four cards. Assuming you don't have any kind of bonuses, like the plus one counters it puts on itself. And, you know, and then from there, you get to either gain life or put another plus one counter on it. So this is a card that definitely, um, you know, starts to spite a lot of control. The nice thing too is that it does have uh, trample. So if they do block it, you can maybe get through a damage or two. You know, exile a car, a creature, make it even bigger. So I actually do like this card, uh, you know, quite a bit. The only downside to this, of course, is it doesn't really like, protect itself well. But I mean, triple haste is uh, pretty strong, and you know, especially as like a sideboard card, I can see that being uh, quite uh, quite useful, right? So it's that's the one thing like to not having you know read a ton of the spoilers for the set is that you get surprised by cards like that where you read them and you're like, you know, five mana, four four, whatever, and then you're like, actually, this is pretty good. It's kind of like a, you know, Scavenging Ooze's big brother, and I've always, you know, a huge fan of Scavenging Ooze. And it's nice that this one doesn't require additional mana, but the downside, of course, being that you can't activate it. And really, you know, the whole sub-game of Scavenging Ooze, having mana open and preventing your opponent from doing what they want to do, is not there. So now we have Iron Golem, so it definitely feels like a D&D inspired card. But it is kind of ugly artwork. <laughs> Oops. All right, and we got white is uh, right behind it. So this is our rare. Um, so it's two mana, three, two, edges the battlefield tapped, okay. So it's like that. So if you're not sure why all this, these zombie cards in the battlefield tapped, it's supposed to kind of represent the slow shamblingness of zombies and how they're kind of like plodding along. So they're, you know, not really kind of like the more modern movies where they have sometimes have these like, in video games you have zombies that just leap out at you and chase you. These are kind of representing kind of the old school, you know, Night of the Living Dead style zombies. So this one has um, Life Drain. Whenever a creature dealt damage by the by white uh, dies this turn, create a 2-2 black zombie token and exile that card. So seems pretty good. I mean, most of the time, you know, you might trade with this and then get a 2-2. So, you know, again, not a card that's going to like blow you away in terms of uh, value or anything, but it seems like a fine, uh, you know, if you have a zombie deck, like takes off again, we've seen those in the past. Um, this certainly I could see being a big part of that in terms of filling out the curve, you know, being a 3-2. Um, especially if it gets any kind of other bonuses, and then when it dies, you get to replace it with a 2-2. You know, to say, to say nothing of, like, the later game where your opponent has to, like, chump block, um, and you get to keep this plus make a 2-2, like, that to me, like, I don't see your opponent winning that game if you're doing things like that, right? If they're forced to chump block this, yeah, you're winning. Okay, here we go. You, uh, Yuan T. Malison. Uh, so Snake Rogue, so I love me some snakes. Um, so it's a 2-1. Uh, can't be blocked as long as it's attacking alone. So it's got, um, you know, that nice kind of exalted ability. And when it deals common damage to a player, venture into the dungeon. So you had me until the <laughs> venture in the dungeon part. Um, yeah, I would have been down for this card. You know, it was like a draw card or maybe a draw card would have been a little too strong. Uh, you know, something else, you know, maybe bounce a creature to your hand or something. I would have been like, yeah, this card's sick. But I eh, venture in the dungeon. It's fine. Well, let me put it at that. I think it's fine. Ooh, I like the art on that. Baldur's Gate. So I, I always, I played, I love me some Baldur's Gate. Definitely played that back in the day. Lurking 
Roper. Okay, so this is a 4-5 for 3. It doesn't untap during your untap step. Whenever you gain life, untap Lurking Roper. So this is actually be good in the um, Strixhaven, the Black Green um, uh, deck. I was playing that because the Commander deck recently, and yeah, this definitely would be great in that, right? By great, I mean playable in it. Ooh, we get uh, Ochre uh, Jelly. So this is a X Green, so uh, X, X, it gets X plus one counters on it, um, and it's got Trample. And when it dies, if it had two or more plus one counters on it, create a token that's a copy of it at the beginning of the next end step. The token enters the battlefield with half many counters on it, rounded down. Okay, so the way I understand that to be would be that it keeps, um, we're down to four packs. Um, it keeps, uh, you know, getting smaller, essentially. You're, you're cutting it in half every time. So as they chop that ooze down, it gets smaller and smaller. So your initial ooze size is quite important. So I love the flavor of that. All right, and then we get a uh, kind of a controversial card. Uh, Tasha's Hideous Laughter. So this is a mill card, so it's three mana, exiles. Um, each opponent exiles cards from the top of their library until that player's exile uh, cards with total mana value 20 or more. So this is more for a card um, that I've seen people talk about in, like, in terms of modern, where there's a lot more lower mana costs and you know, depending on the deck, you can almost mill your opponent out for, you know, their whole deck in like one swing with that card. So, again, I don't know if it's going to be good enough for mill. Um, I secretly hope not, because I'm not a big fan of playing against mill, especially exiling mill. You know, it's one thing if you can get like your armor cool to like reshuffle your library and graveyard together. But if they get to like mill you, you know, your whole deck or like three quarters of your deck or something scary like that, then you're probably dead. Uh, Portable Hole, I know, is a card that was spoiled pretty early. Seems, seems quite strong. And our... Rare is another Hobgoblin Bandit Lord. So that's our second one. And we get Loth Spider Queen as our emblem. So that's our third emblem, which is kind of rare. Usually, I guess there's maybe not as many emblems. Um, I think the set has five Planeswalkers. But it's still rare to see that many. So maybe that's a sign that they're gonna be printing more of them. Because I mean, you should be able to get them relatively easily, right? Um, you know, it always stinks that if, you know, you can't get like the emblem. I don't know how expensive emblems are. I mean, they never were crazy expensive, but oops. Uh, but it was always kind of a pain having to track some of the them, especially if there were ones that get used multiple times. Like the, I remember there was like the Soren that creates a plus one, plus zero emblem, and that could be tricky to find. But I mean, ultimately, you know, whatever. It doesn't have to be an official emblem. And then we get Nadar, Selfless Paladin. So I love the Dragon Knight art. The art is crazy. Uh, so it's a 3-3 Vigilance, and when it enters the battlefield or attacks, venture in the dungeon. And then other creatures you control get plus one, plus one, as long as you complete a dungeon. So this to me would be like one of the reasons to play a dungeon deck. Um, you know, cards like that, right? Where the payoff, not only for getting into the dungeon, but also once you complete a dungeon is quite strong. You know, giving your creatures plus one, plus one. Uh, and only downside, of course, being that it is legendary, so you can't just stack like two or three of these and go to town. All right, last pack. So let's see what we got. Oops. Choose your weapon, cool. And we get Instrument of the Bard. So I laugh because I've read this card out when I got it in my uh, prize packs. Uh, beginning your upkeep, you may put a Harmony counter on it and they can pay four mana, tap it, search your value for a creature with mana value equal to the number of Harmony counters on, on this, reveal it, put it in your hand. If that card is a legendary creature, create a uh, treasure token, shuffle your library. Um, yeah, I think like Birthing Pod spinning in its grave reading this card, right? Like, the fact that it puts in your hand, I don't know. It is, it's just way too much mana, it's way too slow. You know, you have to kind of keep putting car, and even putting the things on to get a decent creature. Ooh, the foil force is very nice though. Best part about the pack, not even lying. Oh, it would've been, been funny if we got the same model art and spider token. But yeah, that instrument of the bars is just, that's like wanting to make a card that does that, but like not wanting to make it scary playable. All right, so let's just quickly see. Um, how we did, um, I think we, what, hit four mythics, maybe? But to be honest, like I got the one I wanted, so um, the number doesn't really bother me as much as it normally would. Yeah, we only hit four mythics in the box. Um, but again, I got the one I wanted, so. I'd say like of the three or four I got, I think the Demi Lich and the Flame Skull are, are probably the better ones for constructed. The Book of the Vile Darkness is cool, flavor-wise and everything, but you know, I can't see it, you know, being any more in casual. And this card, I think 
probably not going to be constructed playable, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody plays it one, one or two copies in a deck. Um, and then like some of the rares, like the wolf, uh, werewolf pack leader was, you know, surprisingly pretty good. And, you know, the, the, like the lands are pretty sick. So, you know, there end up being a lot more in the set than I think that I might initially had thought um, as far as like for constructed magic, um, you know, and you know, obviously there's more stuff that I didn't open, but like even these cards are pretty cool. I was happy to open those um, in like the Loyal Warhound sick. So overall, you know, pretty happy with the set and how the box went. Um, so yeah, thanks for thanks for joining me. Hopefully you uh, enjoyed watching me uh, open these packs and got to see a little bit what the set's about. And uh, till uh, till next time, take care. Bye.